by our rules and Carl standing out there that since I'm a safe distance away at the microphone, I can take off my, uh, my mask. Al although uh, it, it, it is interesting to look out at groups of people with masks. Um, at, uh, for those who don't know who I am, I'm Fritz Steiner and it's my honor to be uh, the Dean of the Stuart Weitzman School of Design. And at the beginning of um, the pandemic, um, uh, when we, March of 2020, when things were shutting down, um, we realized um, that uh, for architecture education, uh, the studio was vital. Um, and it was vital to teaching architecture and to learning uh, how to design. And so we had a dilemma. Um, and I, um, uh, when I was talking with the other deans and with the provost and the president, um, I realized that the, the School of Veterinary Medicine was going to continue to be open, uh, as was the dental school and ha as was the medical school. And I, I started, I, I sort of started to make the argument that uh, the vet, like the vet school, um, sooner or later, um, you, you, you can't learn how to operate on a goat uh, abstractly. I mean, at, at a certain point, you need the goat. I mean, you just can't pretend, you can't, you can't zoom the goat. I mean, you can learn a, a, a bit about the goat by zooming. Um, but I, I, so I, I made the argument that um, we needed um, to have our studios in order to learn much like the veterinary medicine students needed their goats. And the, the argument worked. Um, and uh, we were able to uh, engage in a hybrid form of education uh, where the studios uh, remained open. Now, why is this in any way relevant to uh, me being up here to introduce my colleague, uh, Vika Doubledum? Um, I, I think that architecture education um, really uh, depends on people who are architects. Um, I mean, that may seem somewhat obvious, but um, like our friends in veterinary medicine, you learn, uh, they learn from someone who knows about goats uh, and they know about chickens and they know about other things. Um, effective teaching in architecture, uh, one has to know about building and the best way, I think, of, of, of gaining such knowledge is to be engaged in practice oneself. And um, Vinka um, is, is an exemplar of that, uh, of a reflective practitioner, of a uh, practitioner educator. Uh, there's all kinds, I suppose, uh, hyphens that we could put there. And as, as an alum of the school myself, um, I had heard about Vinka. Um, I, I know she began teaching here in 1995. Um, for 10 years, she took over the post-professional degree program at a vital time when uh, post-professional education and architecture was undergoing a dramatic change. And through her leadership, uh, our AAD program really became the exemplar nationwide of uh, what a post-professional design education, and architecture education could be. So um, I actually knew more about Vinka as a practitioner uh, than as an educator before returning. And I, I Paul, and I know we're all in for a treat because the first time I heard her speak, um, I was um, still uh, the dean at the University of Texas at Austin and unbeknownst to Vinka, who we, I chatted with afterwards, uh, I'd already been offered the job here. So um, 
I, I, it was, a, it was for, for me a kind of funny moment because I was meeting a new colleague that didn't know I was a, a colleague. Um, but I, I, that, that lecture really stood out to me because it, um, uh, Vinka talked about her work as an architect. Um, and it, we, in addition to her leadership here in the school, um, her firm, uh, Architectonics, uh, Architectonics, uh, is, um, it, it keeps every year getting more and more uh, national and now international re re uh, renowned. Um, the new Asian Games, uh, or Asia, Asian Games um, project, which I'm sure we'll see a few images of tonight, um, is really a major piece of work. Um, so uh, we're at a point where we have a very important architect in our midst who has a body of work, and that body of work is, um, has been appreciated by her peers for some time, but is starting to reach uh, a wider and wider audience. And I'm sure the new book is just going to propel that audience even wider. So it's uh, a great honor for me to put my mask back on and join you uh, and introduce my friend and colleague, Vinka Doubledock. Thank you. So great, I can take that off. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> I was wondering how I was going to do that with this mask on. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's a super pleasure to be back in this building. You know, after all the years of saying that we thought this building wasn't the best building, I think now it's the best building because we haven't seen it for so long. So, yeah, I want to thank you all for coming. And I, I had uh, today, you know, I, uh, yeah, we are going to talk a little bit about the book. But what I mostly want to talk about is what we do uh, as architects, and that is projects. And the reason why I want to talk about projects is because, one, I'm very passionate about it, um, as we all are, as architects and students, uh, but also because projects only happen when there are amazing teams, and a project also implies process. And I think process and teams are really important for projects to be built, but also for books to be published. But maybe the most important project of all is where we are now, and that is academics and education. I think that because I've, we find a spot here in academics and education where we have agency and where you as a student can learn to have agency, understanding that whatever you make whatever form you put in place, will always represent everything that happens in culture, in society. You are able to adopt innovations in technology, uh, translate that in design. So this idea of translation is what starts here. I wanted to give you a little rundown, not to go back in history, um, but to uh, maybe for you students to show what happens in education on an ongoing basis. And maybe I go back in order to, to also allow you to see what could happen in the future. Um, and as this is also a project, and I have to say, I never thought I wanted to be a chair, to be honest. <laughs> um, but when they asked me to apply, I have to say, it was one of the funnest things. Because we are here in a group of people that are absolutely the smartest, the funnest, and the most amazing peers and colleagues uh, you will find in your life. It's a safe environment, and it's an environment that is incredibly inspirational. So funny, the thing I didn't want to do became one of the things that I really love to do. So this is how we were called. There's, I actually found some old slides, which, sorry guys, I mean, you'll see yourself in a few years ago. but. Um, so this, these are some old slides. So we used to be pen design. And of course, um, this is going a little bit further back, but this person, as you know, Louis Kahn, is a very, very important past in, um, 
in, in Penn, and not only because he's an amazing architect and urban builder. I actually didn't know he was Estonian, um, but that, but what I love is the combination of these two things. You know, the fact that you start with an idea and your idea then results in a super complex form here, the Exeter Library. Um, and of course, that also happens with uh, a French person, Robert Le Ricolet, that actually never got an architectural engineering degree. He studied some physics, he studied some mathematics, but he actually never graduated or even studied architecture and engineering. He went on to teach for 20 years at Penn and taught the most rigorous, absolutely most adventurous, uh, incredible structures. And Louis Kahn, who used to be, or was the uh, original Cray chair professor, um, when he passed away in 1974, he gave that, uh, or it got passed on to Le Ricoulet, who had it for one year before he retired. But I think it's quite amazing that someone who actually is completely self-taught became one of the experts in, um, in advanced uh, structural thinking. And as you can see, not because it was structural, because it was daring, because it was incredibly challenging, and because it was often dynamic, right, kinetic. Uh, what is also really beautiful, of course, is that this is still in our archives, that this went all the way through different professors to Mohamed al Kayer, who actually is a direct um, student or descendant still from Le Ricolet. So not only does Penn have amazing past, we actually like to carry that past with us because sometimes we just have the best people. And then, uh, of course, Joseph Rickard, we have to mention him, amazing history theory uh, professor, uh, won a gigantic award only, I think, two years ago, the, the Royal Institute British Architects Gold Medal, not many people get that, and uh, has written numerous amounts of books that were translated almost in every possible, possible language. And I wouldn't be a woman if I didn't find the first female chair at our department, um, Adele Santos, who is incredibly inspirational still. She is now the dean at MIT. And what was quite nice to see is that she uh, also promoted something I feel very strong about, is research. I think we architects are often pushed in the box of design. Sure, we are amazing designers. But I think more, than, more important than just being a designer is that we are innovators, we are thinkers, we are rigorous, and we combine design with research. One thing Penn has been very known for, and I didn't know it started as early as with Adele in the 80s, um, is that we are standing for design research, which means we don't put a pause between design and research. We don't research something and then design something. We actually think of research and design as one integral uh, thought process that makes that we can make things that are rigorous, that are integral, and that are hopefully surprising to many people. So this is the year that I started as um, chair. It's the year that I met uh, Fritz also in Texas. And uh, this was actually the poster that we had. We, we were then called the PPD. The, so the MSD in AAD was called the PPD, was postgraduate. And um, I learned a few things from, that, from running that program. I ran it from 2003 to 2013. And one thing I learned is there's too many men in architecture, <laughs> although I love all these people. <laughs> um, actually, um, I was just thinking Feta still had hair here. But we had <laughs> Roland Snooks from Australia. We had Francois Roche from France, who was then still in France, now in Bangkok. Uh, Inyaki is from Mexico. So, I mean, we've always been extremely international. Uh, but the other thing I learned is that in order to communicate uh, your thoughts, you have to write. You have to write about it. You have to communicate uh, not only internally, but definitely also externally. 
And that's what I thought of then. I became chair after there were five years or six years of interim chairs, and, and it's not good for the department, you know, because you need someone that actually gets hot and heavy about things. Um, I thought Penn was like an oyster. Now, this is actually quite a good-looking oyster, I think. I meant more the rough, rough, ugly version. I realized when I put this on, it almost looks like an architecture project. Um, anyway, we were like an oyster. We were really rough, really closed, and no one really knew that we existed and that actually we had an amazing beauty and richness and quality here. And why was that? And I realized very quickly that, um, you know, I, I started in January, and I remember in January I thought, well, I'm going to just take the spring, get used to this place, being the chair, you know, and um, start in fall. And then, you know, a week or two into it, I was like, okay, and then I have to, <laughs> to just dive in. So I made five points for myself not to go completely crazy. Um, Point one was to open up pen, to start talking to peers, like how do we talk to the world? What do, what do we want to say and what we do, do we stand for? A curriculum is always an ongoing uh, evolution. How could we keep that going? Where did we want to go? How did we want to keep innovating it? And could we maybe get external experts in? Um, we wanted to add new summer programs. We're going to start these back up, don't worry. Um, we had already an amazing London program, as you all know. Um, we had an amazing Paris program with Annette, and we added a Columbia program with Eduardo, and a Greece program with Ezio and Daniela. And, um, the other, and I was still also, by the way, the director of the famous PPD, uh, which was a bit much, of course, as chair, so um, I was very happy when Ali Rahim uh, was willing to take that over. He became then the director of the, um, then we converted that to M MSD, AAD. So that was a great thing for us because not only did we start an MSD and AAD, we started the idea of MSDs, which means you can have more. So as you now know, we have one in EBD that used to be the MABD. Uh, and we have one in RAS, Robotics and Autonomous Systems. I know some of you are here. Um, and then the last one was, you will not believe it, but we didn't have any 3D printers at all. Um, we had only uh, Dennis Fab Lab. And um, we didn't have any robotics, obviously, in 2003. But um, that, was, that was basically my little list. It was not a small list. So, to start with dialogues, um, you know, you always have to make a point when you start. So I started um, together actually with the people from the PPD, we started a conference called The New Normal. Because the idea was that if you want to start dialogues and you want to open up publications, symposia every year, lecture series. Uh, it sounds all pretty normal now, right, because we're doing this, but then that was not so normal. Hence, The New Normal. The new normal had a very simple statement. After 20 years of digital design, by then already 20 years, digital was normal. I was completely exhausted by, the, by people constantly saying new, right? It was no longer new, it was normal. And if that was normal, from where do you go, right? Like where do you go to? Like what is the new after digital is normal? So that was this conference. You can still probably find something about it. Um, that was in 2013. In 2014, believe it or not, we were one of the first ones to invite Graham Harmon, which I, which I had heard about the triple O. He still lived in Cairo. I couldn't afford to fly him over. So together with um, Michael Speaks at Syracuse, we paid for his trip. He gave a lecture at Penn, and then we had a conference with Penn and Syracuse together in New York City. This is quite funny to think about it, you know, and the reason why I'm doing this also, as you'll see later, is like, I always ask the students, which lectures would you like next? And, and often you come up with a list of lectures that I'm thinking, well, we already had these people. And then I realized, you just started, or you're in second, third year, I'm now a dinosaur. So the lectures that, that we had eight years ago, you obviously don't know. So anyway, so now you know, Graham has been here and he can come again. I now understand this. Um, we also did a, a really great conference on city futures, not to be confused with urban design, not urban design. Really city futures. What's the future of the city? 
We had the city with infrastructures, the unplanned city, and the imaginary or speculative city. We had, finally in 2016, I was super excited, not only faculty started taking over, but the female faculty started taking over. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so Hannah organized Under Pressure. It was the housing um, studio that um, took that on. Hannah is also in this lecture series, so she will be presenting her book very soon. And uh, it was an amazing group of people. The um, faculty of 601 was involved. And uh, it was an unbelievably interesting uh, conference because housing traditionally is considered, a, you know, not a 10 actually since Hannah started. But, you know, in the old days when I studied, it was kind of the boring subject. Thank God we now know that housing is super exciting. And obviously, if you look at this list, it's an amazing list of city planners, thinkers, um, very famous architects, and a lot of really, and, and actually, I actually forgot that, that Lea, uh, who is here now with us, was already there in that conference. Um, the next year got even more exciting, it was the students, the women in architecture took over. So the women in architecture, together with Franca Trubiano, um, made an amazing conference and um, also published a book. So what, I, what I'm trying to say here, what I really love is the fact that not only did we start having conferences, but we really started publishing. And that, that started to really um, excel and sort of self-propel also. This one was a really important one. Um, this was Daniel Barber, Sophie Hochhausel, Eduardo Rega, and Naomi Wal Waltham. And it was a, quite an important um, uh, conference in the sense it looked at instability in society, inequity, uh, social structures, and um, basically, it looked at how the 21st century has legible histories of architecture and related spatio-temporal um, disciplines that are engaged in questions of economy, gender, race, and environment. And obviously, what I said before, you know, as architects and, and our um, idea of change and agency is really, really important, obviously, also in this conference. Uh, the next year, we had um, Architecture Theory Now. That stated um, that architecture theory is an impasse and maybe even passé. Um, also stated more comprehensive intellectual tools are needed to interpret, assess, and evaluate the long-term social cultural implications of architectural work, in particular in relationship to the highly technological expansion of design and building. The symposium proposed to make a new start in defining architecture theory now. So also incredible group of thinkers, um, very international, and I'm not sure that I think at some point this was going to lead to a book and maybe uh, it will still happen. Organized by Franca, David, and Peter Lawrence. Then this is your poster right now. And I thought it'd be kind of fun. This is for you guys when you give me suggestions for new lectures. So all these people have been already. That doesn't mean necessarily they can't be here again. But what is really nice is you see the mix of theoretical thinkers, just some people from Africa, from um, Istanbul, from um, Beirut, uh, Europe, uh, the US. Um, but what, what I love is the, the very, very interesting mix. So this list uh, I now have, so I can give it to you guys. But when I got, last time when I, normally I asked the women in architecture, the diversity, the students and the diversity group and the student council to ask all the students, you know, like what kind of lectures would you like? So the last time I got the list, it was more or less this list. So now I know they were actually good people, right? Um, and then what we do is we, we think it's very important, as I said, so what I learned from the postgraduate program is to publish. You have your work in these books, they're called Pressing Matters. The first one was number two, for the simple reason that Pressing Matters number one was actually a book in the postgraduate program, and I thought it'd be very kind of interesting when you start with number two, you know, kind of putting everyone on the wrong foot. 
So number two was the very first one. It's designed by WSDIA. Uh, all the posters you saw before also. Uh, because the other thing I think is really important is that you need to be recognizable to the outside. They always recycle paper, uh, toxic free inks. Um, and we print the, the kind of minimal amount and the rest we put for free as an ebook um, on, the, on the internet. And then this one, number nine, is actually just out. Um, but number 10 is already at the printer. And what I think is really interesting um, of number nine that is just out is that we started uh, writing together, the faculty together started writing about how we have changed uh, education as we are um, looking at it. So what was really interesting is that uh, we started to understand that if you have um, structures, construction, professional practice, visual studies, um, history theory, that all these things, of course, in practice, are integrated in the design, right? But if you are in academics, they tend to be kind of what we call the bastions, no? the big towers, they're really important. But what about if these experts came down and taught you in studio? So not to necessarily confuse that you are not going to get double classes, but to sort of say, like, for example, what we do in, um, to, to mention Hannah again, what Hannah is doing is asking professional practice um, uh, Phil Ryan uh, advice or Dorit helps with the facade um, things and then in Dorit's and Phil Ryan's classes you can use at your you can look at your own designs so we do this on purpose to understand how um, or to help you understand how this in in practice is completely one thing you know we have a very 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 complex profession so what we are trying to kind of simulate all the time um, is how to make this a natural thing. How do you make structures integral in your thinking when you're designing something? How do you think of how you put things together like you're learning in construction? Because in reality, you have to do this later. So we call that cur curriculum updates. We started in 2003, and this happens through committees. There will be a history theory committee. The first one was in 2003. We had a tech committee with Bill Brame which was the most rigorous revision of uh, technology uh, classes. And so in these moments, it's when we check, you know, how we progress. And then there's also really drastic jumps. This was one of the drastic jumps. This is when we um, uh, started to ch do another thing, how we change curriculum is we get people in. And this person here, is, you might remember, um, who's sitting over there is Andrew Saunders. He was the first person that we hired. When I started, we had um, seven or eight standing faculty members from which there were three women, I think. Now we have 16 standing faculty members of which are eight women. So we're getting better. Um, but only, what also is really great, we have slowly been growing. So we've not only grown the standing faculty, we've also been able to have a very extended body of what we call associate faculty, but all the full-time lecturers, the senior lecturers, our practice professors, and all the people that are in practice and are still willing to give us some time and, and uh, are with us as lecturers. So Andrew was the, the first one that joined the standing faculty, and um, with that also changed the first year curriculum. And we started um, uh, building um, this was actually made from plashing. We built this gigantic uh, pavilion um, because we thought it should be possible to do that, right? So um, the students were folding. This was Panovation's first year open. We had a space there, and the students started folding these boulders from plashing. And then eventually with Mohammed, who did um, a structure. So it's actually a little bit the same what you guys in first year now do with the container. Then we did pavilions, the one pavilion would win, and then the pavilion would be built in the spring with Mohammed's uh, seminar. The second year we built uh, this little one that was beautiful lit at night, it was called Overcast. And then uh, we did a third one that I forgot to put in. But what was really great, of course, again, we published it. So 57 pavilions, that was a total number in three years. 
um, was published. Uh, Andrew put that all together for us, and we were all super excited that our first year students found themselves in MoMA for sale in a book. So I think this was also the year that I, we had um, an open house, and or, or we actually had a conference, and there was a, a competition that Annette holds in the beginning of uh, the second semester, and the work was up on the walls. And uh, I said, just for fun, when I opened uh, the conference, I was like, yeah, and this is then our first year work. And I remember the faces of the people where they were like, this is first year work? Yeah, and it's also in a book. So, you know, I'm a little bit proud sometimes. Um, of course, we kept going with our new faculty. It took me a long time to convince uh, Mr. Tom Main here uh, to join us. Um, I remember Tom saying, maximum three years. Uh, as a great professor, uh, I had Marilyn Taylor, the then dean, involved. It was a, and then uh, thank God he did join us. It's been an absolutely amazing um, time, and he is then also fulfilling the role of our great professor um, of practice. Um, and then now I'm now I'm just going in strings because then of course we we hired Sophie Hochhausel, history theory. Robert and Masoud were one search. They were so amazing, we had to get both of them. Um, Dorit Aviv was the year after. Lea was shortly after. Uh, Feda, you would think, why is he in here? Feda, um, because he had a practice, was usually a practice professor, but very exciting, and you might have missed this. Last year, he became part of our standing faculty. So Feda is now uh, part of our standing faculty. And then uh, Matthijs has been with us um, as a practice professor um, for resilience and runs also the certificate for resilience. And we're super happy to have Billy Ferkloof, who's uh, an adjunct professor and is very actively involved in the MSD EBD, but also teaches um, uh, a beautiful writing course for the RES. And I'm trying to drag her back into architecture. So a bit, bit of a a thing there. Um, the other thing we did in order to get out in the world is exhibits. Uh, my first exhibit was the most nerve-wracking one, which was like we had to do accreditation. And you can see it was 2016. Um, you know, chairs are actually not really worked in. You get thrown in. So by 2016, I kind of started to understand what I was in for. Thank God for the faculty. Um, and we had to do this. Josh Fries was enormously helpful. Um, and uh, what was, we were also, <laughs> it was quite interesting, we were a pilot, a test pilot for the, for the NAP in the sense that they said, well, we're giving you a very short review and you're gonna be our test case. And I think we had, and it, I don't remember, three days or something that we had to do everything with these people. But what was really great is they, uh, they left us with, of course, some notes. Um, we passed most of it. We had five points of distinction, um, which I was quite proud of, because one was the interdisciplinary nature, not only between um, departments, but also internally. Um, they said that basically the integration of advanced technology uh, as teaching, learning, and research tool is very unique and a signature. The student's work goes well beyond the understanding level of the criteria to a high level of ability. So this is no pressure, of course. You know, you just don't have to get nervous. Um, research is the hallmark of the program, and that, I think, is very important because I believe in that very strongly. Uh, it, it begins with the initial design studio, continues through the subsequent studios, and then, of course, they loved our facility space. You know, we were all frowning, but and that was mostly, I think, um, Bill Whitaker who, who just made them fall in love with the archives. Um, but right now, we are eighth in, uh, in the world ranking, and I'm almost happier with the, the bottom one. We are fifth in the most um, um, the students that are most hired. And I think this is why we work really hard for our students. We, we think it is really important that you go out in the world and you're fully equipped and you know what you're in for. Um, also proud of the fact that our students are currently winning most of the awards. I think the HOK awards, you won all three, uh, first three prizes. 
Uh, but this was also a very nice one. Franca uh, pointed at this, uh, that we should do this. Andrew took, uh, took it upon himself to really organize this. And then six of our students uh, were in the Metropolis Future 100 Award. So it was really, really great. And I think it is um, a real compliment to our faculty and the way uh, you as students are picking up the work. The more fun exhibitions were, of course, this is the Venice Biennale, uh, Eva Strada, who um, I asked to, uh, we were invited by the Egyptian government uh, to look at uh, downtown Cairo. So for three years, uh, we did projects with the, the Egyptians. And the second year, they said, could you please join the Egyptian pavilion? So here we are, the Venice Biennale, but we're in the Egyptian pavilion, which was really fun. Um, this is the Biennale in 2018, where we took 12 objects, 12 images, but also 12 studios. So this is the work of basically um, quite a lot of the students. And then this was uh, this year, uh, as you know, COVID has caused mayhem everywhere. Um, the Biennale was uh, not different. Uh, I became one of the creative directors for the virtu virtual Italian pavilion that was uh, moderated by uh, Tom Kovac from Australia and Alessandro Melis from, Ita from Italy. And um, I did nothing else than just invite six of our faculty that had interesting design research that I thought worked well together as an exhibit. And those six faculty um, then uh, produced movies. So if you haven't seen it, I would definitely try and um, find the movie, sorry, I'm like not looking at my notes at all. Um, it was uh, Karol Klein, actually, I think it's the next one. Here you go. It's uh, Masoud, Dorit, Karol Klein, Freda Kolatam, Lea Mogasodivia, and Robert Stewart Smith. Um, what was really great is by sheer coincidence, I heard that Cynthia Davidson was, um, and this is actually the website, right, where you can see the virtual exhibit. Um, that Cynthia Davidson was doing a, a log um, panel with uh, six different ones. And um, so I called her and said, would you like us to do one with you? And she had no ideas yet, so she was super excited, and we did. And I think it was, we had 3,000 visitors, and um, it was a super interesting discussion. And I think it's one of those moments that you're actually in an exciting Zoom call. Um, where a lot of people like from Yale, from Cornell, from Harvard were, were getting into the discussion and, and talking to, uh, to all of us. And then this will all be published in this big orange book that they're currently working on. And then of course, as I said, when I started, there was no 3D, 3D printing and robotics. So the first thing I just found out about these little things called MakerBots um, and I, in my innocence, I saw some money in my budget. I bought five or six of them. And um, Marilyn had bought the projects in the, in the, the bigger 3D printers in the, in the workshop. So that was, uh, was kind of cute. And the idea was really uh, kind of an important one, I think. If you design 3D in the computer, you have to test it in real time. So I did not buy the MakerBots for the students to work in the studio to make final models. The really, I, th I really strongly believe in making prototypes to test and rigorously uh, investigate what you actually have. And I'm much less interested in a final model and much more interested in all the test models. So that's why I put them straight in studio. I think we were the first school to have that. And then of course, you know, this is, this is actually a while ago because we have more now. You can see them over there. Um, but this, is, this started then to be organized, MakerBot helped us uh, make it into an intelligent swarm, and, um, and we're still using them. And of course now, um, then in 2015 or so, uh, Marilyn asked me to look into uh, getting robots. So that was the very first start of what, you, what we call ARI, which is um, a lab that really started looking at robots. I spent the summer with Andrew Saunders uh, interviewing robotic companies and figuring out which ones to get. And um, then, of course, now this is pretty normal, right? You can look down here on the ground floor and see, thanks to really huge, big sponsorship of several people, um, 
in the Board of Overseers and others uh, and the support of Fritz um, and Marilyn. Um, it's been a huge undertaking to get such a big lab going and uh, especially with me in the beginning, a lot of politics to actually get that space, which was, I think, really meant to be by, used by someone else. But um, yeah, here is where they're doing uh, their thing. And, um, and then, of course, the, the result next to it, I think these are actually Andrew's um, uh, RAS students last semester. Uh, but yeah, it's really, really great. And, and of course, you know, this is, this is the beauty of um, going also outside of the school. Andrew is now also working on a whole wall um, that is being built um, with, with these models, or specifically for that site. Projects. So the, this is, I'm getting finally into the project. The, the book was supposed to be here, believe it or not, but the binder got COVID, actually the whole company of the binder got COVID in Spain. So um, they were supposed to be here, but they're not. Hence you got the, the little thing of the, you can order them yourself with 30% discount. I will bring them at some point, hopefully. But as everything, a project is a team, a project is process, and it takes a long time and rigorous thinking to um, get something done. The first thing that happened is that the publisher did a studio visit in our office and said, you have three monographs, you don't need a monograph. And I was like, well, this is gonna be a very short visit. And um, so I'm sitting there thinking, okay. And he's like, well, I think what you should do is a book that is not a monograph. Like, okay, we got a little bit more positive. So um, he, he was really interested in the way we work. And I think from everything I've said, obviously I believe in research, I also believe in prototyping. And I found on really early on as a young architect, you know, how hard it is to build things. And the way around it that I started to figure out is to work with manufacturers right in the beginning and just skip talking to the contractor too soon. So, um, but anyway, I should introduce um, Jonathan Jackson and Janet are both from WSDIA that also make your books uh, Pressing Matters. Julia from the Houd is from Original Copy, she's our editor. Justin is my partner in Architectonics. Bowen is an alum from Penn, uh, still works a little bit with RES and works in our office. Um, then we have Max Burman, Tala from Beirut, and Dan sits over there, he's now doing the RES. Um, so a lot more people worked on the book, but I thought I'll just add a few. And then um, this is the book that um, is actually printed and is waiting to be bound. Um, the, the title is an interesting one. I'll get into the title. So um, when we started talking about this manual, um, this is from WSDA. They said it's manual, it's a manual, it's archival, it's raw, it's process oriented, it's insightful, it's transparent, it's how to, and it's focused. Um, and then I actually love what they have in their own website. So this is not me, this is um, WSDA. Processor is our guts. So you can see why um, I love working with WSDIA because Jonathan is actually also an architect. So he's an architect and a graphic designer, which means he really is one of those rare people that understands our crazy brains and really um, understands how to translate it. Um, so yeah, he started looking, I'm giving you a little bit of the presentation of how I saw the book through his eyes in the beginning. So he gave us this presentation, it's not a small book. Um, and basically uh, he went through the whole instruction and his idea was really that a manual is something like how you put machines together or a car together. Or like, you know, it's not a construction drawing it's an instruction on how to put things together. So it starts talking about us working with manufacturers, engineers, uh, brainstorming about things, and uh, I love this presentation. So yeah, you end with things. Um, and then in the end, he was like, so it has to be kind of a catalog, and he started uh, explaining that I had to cut holes through my book. Really difficult in the layout. I was like, every time I put something, I was like, oh my God, it's gonna have holes in it. <laughs> 
<laughs> but the holes came from the binder. And if you look at the old car catalogs, the Mercedes, the Fiat's from the 30s, the catalogs always came in these like books and then there were holes in it and you could stick it in a binder. So my, now we, are, we, we kind of do have the holes. You don't see the holes here because the holes were not in the PDF and I only have the PDF right now. But in order, because we were starting to think of this book as manual, as a non-standard book, uh, also understanding uh, architecture as something that is tested and prototyped rather than uh, put in AutoCAD and then on the construction site, I thought to be rigorous and consistent, I should ask Jonathan to write about the book as strange object itself. So the text, um, a system of ordered and disordered uh, manual is his uh, text and I thought it was really important because if you want to be into this system, you need to uh, understand every part of it as that process. So that's hence the idea of projects. Um, the book works more or less like this. Um, it's kind of funny that I'm explaining you the concept of the book, but anyway, it's like I'm the graphic designer, not. Um, it has coding and then here you start to see, so essentially the, the reason of the word strange objects is we tend to prototype and once we prototype, we find um, textures, material uh, properties, behaviors, that we didn't know. And often we, t we design or redesign the project according to that, or we find that the project could be uh, much more strange or much more peculiar because of the things we find, like actually 3, 3D folding glass in this case, or translucent stone in this case, or um, b robotically uh, 3D print, uh, milling, sorry, milling, uh, a recycled wood from an old Chinese house. So all these projects, and you know, you should buy the book because I can't explain all the projects, it'd be like a little long. Um, or in this case, where we actually uh, made um, <laughs> just kind of an existing building, we added the extension. It's kind of ridiculous that the building and the extension became the same size, you know, who does that? So I said to the office, it's time that we make just another building. So we added the third building which is that um, lattice envelope that is actually completely 3D. And um, I started to realize if you do that, you have no building code because I called it a sunscreen. And a sunscreen is not a building, so the building became much bigger than was allowed because it was a sunscreen. So what is quite funny, if you, if you look in the book, the, the inside of the, the envelope, you see the setbacks and the terraces and all the things a building has to go through. But then we just wrapped it in this movable, um, as you can see on the left, it's openable, a climate envelope, which also then was super interesting because in the summer when you close it, it reduces 45% of the overheating of the space, so it becomes passive, uh, passively cooled. And in the winter, if you open the screens, you get uh, solar heating. So we actually overall reduced uh, the energy costs of this house by 50%. Um, plus, you know, it's, a, it's nice to have a bit of privacy in New York. It's like there's a lot of buildings looking at your little terrace, right? So you want to have some privacy. This one was very fun. We did a meditation dorm for um, a client and the client, you know, our clients are not architects. We come up with things and they look at the little model and they're like the 3D printed <laughs> version of this. And they're like, how do I meditate in that? It's like, we should prototype it. So we prototyped the whole thing, one-to-one, -one, in a factory in LA uh, with a friend of mine who's a car designer, and we meditated in the factory. Um, and according to my client, the guy who worked in the factory is like a gigantic big guy who normally does cars, also had to meditate because how could he work on this project if he didn't meditate, you know? It was really important. So it was quite an interesting experience. But, uh, and this is something I had to explain to Tom before, who asked me, like, why do you do small projects and big projects? We do small projects because we feel this is where we can invent, rethink, test, um, have no problem doing something strange. Like, this was also prototype because we completely prefabricated it. 
But then it translates into what uh, Fritz was mentioning earlier is the Asian bins. So the, the whole study of how this dome worked as a holistic space in order for you to help you get out of your everyday chaos and uh, as they call it, you know, your, your busy mind. Um, that, that kind of thinking of that space started to really come back up when we started working on this um, building. And I'll do, I will explain a little bit more about this. So this is the project that we're currently working on. Um, it's one of those projects that you don't get every day. It's, it's an invited competition for five different companies all over the world. Um, I don't think we were supposed to win this. You know, we were the smallest office. We were, um, the one thing I did, and this is maybe interesting for you also in the future. I remember that Jean Nouvel once in a lecture in Colombia said, I have done 45 competitions before I won one. And I was getting there, <laughs> you know, I was thinking, okay. And then I also thought, you know, with the, say, the famous thing, if, you, um, if a donkey hits himself with a stone twice, whatever, that, I, I'm terrible at these kind of statements. Anyway, um, I thought, if you can't keep doing the same thing and expect a different result, that's the, that's the crux. So, not be the architect, not have consultants. Ask the people like Melk, who's an amazing landscape architect, taught here also in the landscape department, um, Jerry Van Eyck and Thornton Tomasetti engineers, we asked them as equal partners. We completely changed the way we normally worked because we realized we're too small, we'll never get it. And then mobility and chain is amazing traffic engineer and um, really good in like also building safety and those kind of things. So we made each other, by making uh, a team of equal partners, suddenly our portfolio looked like we were bigger than the other people that were so big that they had everything in house, which was kind of an interesting effect. Um, but still, the, the client had a massive problem. They had had a competition locally, didn't like any of the designs, were late doing the international competition, and then the, half the people just wanted to do a simple design so they can finish it, right? Because it's 2022, we're in 2018, this competition. Um, and the other half was like, yeah, but maybe we should have something interesting. So, you know, there was a huge discussion, it was supposed to be one day. At some point, one of my friends who was um, involved in the organization called me from China and stuck his phone in the room and said, listen to this. And I heard people screaming and I was like, what's going on? Is it like bad? It's like, well, I think you're gonna lose. But what's really interesting is every time the, the, there's a boss, a big boss and a big, big, big boss in China, you, the, our Chinese students will know this. Uh, and the, that boss came every night around nine o'clock to the room and said, what about that project with the golden circle and the, the valley shopping mall? And he kept doing that every day. So <laughs> finally, what happened is we won, which was like, I mean, I fell off my chair when I heard it. Anyway, let me get in the project. So I think we did win for a good reason. We won for the reason that we did not listen to the rules of the competition. We felt it was really important if you have 116 acres and you have two gigantic buildings and five other buildings, that this is for the city and not just for the games. So we started looking at who is op occupying the park, at what times do they do this, and what is the future of the park after the games. And where the competition had asked to put the two stadiums in the middle of the park is a road, a very large road, eight lane road, a river, and they wanted basically these stadiums right at that road. And we felt that a building has agency. A building can become an instigator of new possibilities, can become a generator of activities. And as we wanted this to be for the city and for the neighborhood, we proposed that these stadiums would be in the middle of the halves, or not middle, but in the, more in the center. And instead of making an underground shopping mall, we made a park dip under the road and the river and connect the two stadiums. So it's kind of a simple principle. 
be it that you had to go under a river, which was, you know, a bit Dutch, you know, to make an aqueduct, which we did. Um, anyway, so really important was that the city also is very connected to the idea of an eco-park, what they call a sponge city, which means you have to have forest pavement, we reconstituted and restored the wetlands, we recreated the natural biome by introducing the, the local vegetation and uh, plants, and we had a zero earth policy um, that we had to stick to, and that's actually the, one of the most beautiful principles, I think. It meant that whatever we dug out for the wetlands and for the valley, we had to keep on site. How great is that? So instead of a perfectly flat site, which it was when we came, now we have all these beautiful bulges, and often under the bulges are buildings, you know, because we had a lot of buildings. So you can see that here. And then we also started looking at how we could create skylights in the bulges, um, so that we would have, for example, a parking with natural ventilation, um, the shopping mall, the valley shopping mall, got solar panel um, awnings that give shade, but also collect energy. And then, lo and behold, this was the funniest moment, you know, we go through construction and you're looking at building and mud, mud and building, and you know, you have months of it. And then one day, we get this. And it was like from like, in like maybe three weeks, they rolled out the grass and they had, um, I had asked them in the beginning, how, how are you gonna make a park? You know, 116 acres. They had enormous amounts of greeneries already reserved and all the trees, <laughs> grown up trees were just waiting. So in those few weeks, they planted all the trees just in time for them to have cherry blossom. I was like, it never stops to amaze me. So this is the, the Valley Village principle. You can see it here. So now you're on the road, you're looking at the, the shopping valley. It has essentially shops on both sides, but most of the shops are around uh, pavilions with grass roofs. Uh, the electricity comes from these uh, wings with solar panels. And um, this feels like this, right, when you're in, but also the park dips down. So it's a green, green shopping area with fountains and things. And then what's quite cute, of course, is when you get construction photos. So here, the drone, uh, the way we do construction drawings, uh, well, the, actually the um, first five months, I went to China to do site visits, which was very large and drove my car from building to building. Um, when I was done with my site visits, we would send the local architect with the drone and we would like hover with the drone in front of a detail. You'll see it in a second. Um, and we started to check. So this, for example, we have also pedestrian bridges that are going over the road and the river also, as well as the, the shopping that goes under. Oops, sorry. And then here you start to see the viaducts. Very funny is because they have no time. They literally made, didn't change anything in our drawings. So because the river had a curve, I drew, I drew the viaduct. We, we also had no time to draw anything, so you know, it was like super fast. So viaduct came by and the river had a curve. I drew the viaduct with a curve. And then lo and behold, they actually built the viaduct, the aqueduct uh, with a curve which is just the funniest thing. So it's, it's been really interesting that this time pressure has led to some really interesting uh, tight organizational moments. Uh, this is one of the buildings. This is a, a field hockey um, stadium that is a hybrid with, um, made um, as a hybrid. Um, you might know this little um, universal principle of two intersecting uh, rings. That is essentially um, quite an old principle, geometric principle, and essentially the the wing that is the, the basically the solar uh, wing for the 5,000 seats is uh, half of that uh, diagram, and the other half is a round field. Uh, we wanted the field to be uh, a park uh, feature, so kind of like a, a landscape sculpture. And the field itself, the sport field, fits uh, easily within that. Um, so here you have the first, it's a very simple building, so 5,000 seats, slightly curved. The back has a glass screen that is the, 
the lobby VIP rooms and things, and then a gigantic free span wing that is 125 meters, so about 375 uh, feet in one free span. And of course, what's interesting when you do that, it's not difficult, it's just hard to keep it down. So these um, abutments you see are heavy concrete abutments that go very deep in the ground because the uplift of this thing is enormous. Um, so it's these big, two big trusses with then little trusses in between. And the, the, in the front, the, the terrain also folds up to the building. So this is a very, it's a very simple building. Uh, we worked, um, what was beautiful because I wanted this thing to be one free span. Um, I asked them to take the tension up in the wing. I'm actually one of those girls who love structures, so I'll admit it right away. <laughs> in case you didn't get that yet. Uh, I studied in a school with 500 guys, three girls, and we had lots of structures. Um, so, there you go. Um, this ring is quite interesting because the ring of the wing, because the thing is so large, is actually five feet at the fattest and four feet at the thinnest. But as you can see, by the time it's that big, it's fine. And I think it's actually very beautiful to have that tension ring be uh, part, of the, part of the building. So here you see the section of the building and then how it sits in the landscape. So the, the field as it dips down in the side is actually um, five meters deep. So what is that? Nine, uh, 15 feet deep roughly. Uh, and it goes to zero. So from later, when these games are over, you can just walk onto the grass, but then you find yourself slowly uh, wrapped by these beautiful ellipse round walls. And the entrance. And then here you see the, the wing as it starts to, so you see how thin the five feet to four feet is. It's absolutely not a problem. Here we start to have actually a building slowly. This is still all under construction, so if you see funny things in the front, that's why. Um, and then the front, as it starts to look um, with the curved glass. And the other building is um, the, it's a field, it's basically um, a table tennis stadium, which is quite funny, I didn't know that existed. And originally we, we were interested in kind of looking at uh, some local, uh, historical artifacts. I think it's always interesting to pick up some of the embedded collective memory intelligence that is already there. This is a trunk that is a mysterious artifact find, found in graves. Uh, they don't quite know uh, the meaning of it, but I thought it was interesting in the sense that it was an intersection of two uh, geometrical shapes. The reason why I was interested in that is because all our buildings had to be hybrids, right? So after the game, this was going to be a concert hall. So we started looking at formal studies to see how we could use that intersection and rotation um, to kind of create something that wasn't a singular one-liner building or what they call a white elephant, right? You see it, it's what it is, it's what it stays. So, you know, the famous problem with stadiums. We wanted to make a building that had complexity, character, behavior, and, and some sort of flexibility inside that would allow it to be different things. So anywhere, somewhere in here is the, the final one, that's this one. And what happened because of the intersection is also that you get, um, we have a brass shingled skin and a diagrid glass skin. Those start to intersect and what you get is instead of um, a symmetrical building, you get a set of, we call it bobbly disks. So you get a set of bulging disks that are intersecting and that are switching materials around. You'll see that in a second. But also important was the seating. So whereas arena is like that, a concert could be like that, the hybrid version uh, became that. So this, this all while understanding that you still have to follow Olympic rules. Um, so here you start to see it. There's, we also thought it was really important to have natural light. So there's a disc hanging down and there's actually a skylight above it. And then above it, you see the day for sports and the night for concerts. And so it's an intersection of two volumes, a bamboo inner bowl 
And the diagram here, uh, you see that is the lobby with a set of uh, rings uh, and ramps. Here you're on the ramp uh, going around the, the inner ball. And then here you start to see details of um, how these intersections start to create the bulging uh, moments that they actually build amazingly. Really interesting is um, our biggest friend, and you'll see this in a second, became uh, the BIM guide. And maybe the other thing is if you work in China, you give a construction set this big, and then you realize a few, mo few months later that the contractor set is this big. And I was like, when we had these meetings on Zoom, I was like, what's that little set he has? So I actually had to give a lecture in China and I offered a client to come for an extra site visit. And I said to my business partner, we're taking the whole set, which is big. <laughs> so we dragged the set there. And then we were in a meeting with like, I don't know, 30 people, landscapers, lighting, BIM people, structural engineers, everyone. And every time they had a question for us, we would go, oh, that's page, you know, 14, whatever. And they would be like, hmm. So lunch with the client, lunch with the contractor, client leaves, contractor comes running. I was like, can I have that set? <laughs> and I knew this was the case, right? That's why I dragged it there. So I was, yeah, sure, here, poop. So big, huge set, off he went. And uh, we got his email, we sent it the PDF with all the drawings. And then what was really great is that his BIM guys just started like contacting us. You know, I'm working on your awning. What do you want? Like, how do you, you'll see photos in a second. I'll show, I should show you actually. Anyway, uh, diagrid, really important for the diagrid was that um, I actually did not want round glass. I wanted the building to have a ton of texture. So where the brass shingles were overlapped, I also wanted the glass to feel like it was almost like a fish scale skin and the glass to be um, uh, planar. And we found the biggest possible size, which was six meters by, I think, four meters. Um, and we made triangular uh, little units on the big diagrid that allow for the glass to be planar, but also the light to be catched all the time different. So you start to see here, it gives a really beautiful effect and it completely changes how it's made. Oh, let me get out of this. No, no, no. Oh. So this is now the inside of the, of the space. You see the ring as it is hanging. Um, this, is, this is taken at night, but there is a skylight above it. And what is also quite fun is if you do a table tennis stadium, you cannot do air conditioning because the ball is tiny and is very um, easy to move, right? So what we're air conditioning is the seats. So under the seats is where the air conditioning is. The people are air conditioned and the space is not. And it's quite a, quite a fun thing to work on, you know? It's actually exactly the same in the meditation room. You cannot meditate and feel air flying around, right? It's completely distracting. So there we also had the air completely distributed so finely that you wouldn't feel it. The sounds we had in micro speakers hidden, uh, so you wouldn't uh, hear any directional sound. Uh, and the same here, so you, you kind of like, what is really interesting, sometimes the simplest space, like we did a bamboo dome for the meditation, was the most high tech. We need the over our, over our acoustic uh, department to make it acoustically good, we needed a major audio company to get the micro speakers to work. It was quite funny how um, structural engineering and, and sound and whatever, if you get that right, it is incredible because you're creating a completely other environment. So here is a render. And then construction started. I remember we had a very difficult meeting with the client, which was this meeting. Uh, lots of difficult questions. I'm trying to, the famous set on the table. Uh, I'm trying to explain it. You can see they're thinking this person is difficult. Why do I have to talk to her? Um, <laughs> and then there is the whole set of our local engineer. Uh, Justin is with me also. And um, when we went after this meeting to the restaurant, we, I'm sitting in the back of the car and I look next to me and I see these photos and I'm thinking, 
is someone else building something like that? This is so weird. So I said to, the, to my friend who's driving, it's like, what's that? It's like, oh, it's your site. <laughs> so because of the time pressure, the moment we had done the first drawings, they started the park. So while we were doing all the buildings, they were already building the valley, they were building the park, they were excavating for the parking garages. Um, because you have to imagine there is, so there's two stadiums, a fitness center, a business, a visitor center, uh, two parking garages and a shopping mall. So it's a, it's a lot of building. And then on site, it was like, this is the beginning. You can see there's nothing there. I mean, it was like really hard to even do a site visit on this level. Um, but this was the guy who totally saved us. So he's actually currently also working with Franca in your BIM class. So you might see him. Uh, Calvin, he's sitting here in the middle. Actually, Dan was working in our office, my, my client, and or this is my partner, and then us. And basically, we're discussing, you know, how to get this suspend on. The roof hangs only on the inner bowl, and the rest is suspended. So there's no columns in the whole building. This whole roof floats on an inner ring, um, as you can see here. Had some tensions to solve. <laughs> in BIM. But what was really amazing, so because of BIM, he installed the roof, I think, in uh, 10 segments that were just coming in like this, and then resulted into that. It's so incredible how thin it is. Actually, my suit is like that. <laughs> so, so basically, a susp suspendo means that the roof suspends itself, right? It, it carries itself. Um, and then here, I love this movie. So this is this, so this is my uh, local architect going through it and is looking at it for us. And this is kind of like you know, look at these guys, crazy. So they're putting all these points together, and this is like building of thirty-five thousand square meters, right? What is that? Three hundred fifty thousand square feet. So it's it's crazy to think that these people are essentially putting this together, like knot by knot. But it came in really big segments, so that must have helped them. But it was quite impressive, too. I hate heights, so for me it was not good. But. So then the funny thing is if you zoom in, I was like, I got this photo from the same drone. And I was like, what, what, what is this? Are they having lunch? And it turned out that they were sitting here. So these guys, like you see the tiny blob over there? That's where they're sitting. So these guys are there. Then you can start to see the scale. It is so crazy to think how big this thing is. But here you start to also see how um, the glass um, diacrit is hanging from that same suspend on roof. And in order to get the bottom stiff, we made a, an edge uh, that is also the ramp for the building um, to, to uh, carry that. And then here is same, well, I don't know if it's the same guys, but some of the guys, we have 400 people on site every day. Um, and in COVID, they actually did an amazing thing. They had 400 people go on for two weeks, took them off for two weeks, and another crew would come in for two weeks, and they just kept switching to keep everyone healthy. So it was very, very impressive. But then if you now zoom in on this, right, that's that. So these guys are sitting somewhere over here. So the scale is just uh, enormous. I can't wait to see it myself. Um, and then this, the client made this. This was quite funny. So at some point, um, I think Bowen was on the internet and he was like, look at this. It's quite a, it was very early in construction. Oh, this. It's a little heavy. So this is the, when they're building it, this is the field hockey. The other one, the roof. And you can see how the, the area around it is super, super dense and is all skyscrapers. So I think 116 acres of green they probably deserve. Um, so here you start to see, here, here you get, I, I like to put the dirty pictures in there as well. So like I love this photo because you really see the bulging of the disc. Again, all the, the brass shingles are completely um, uh, organized in BIM. I think he got it down to 5,000 pieces. Um, I think in total there's something like, I don't know, 480,000 piece, pieces. 
Um, so to actually reduce it to a very few different ones is quite impressive. And the diagrid um, is going up here. The back, because of the shifts and the, the turning of the, um, the intersection, as I explained in the beginning, uh, we also got a VIP uh, terrace that overlooks the new wetlands. And here you see the um, uh, fitness center that essentially has a whole park on it and, and again around skylights with ventilation, as you can see here. So although from the air this all looks like park, as you can see here, there's actually a whole fitness center with the Olympic size swimming pool and several basketball courts and God knows what's in there. It's like a huge thing. And then um, you see the other stadium in the, in the back there. There is a lot of built square foot, but also, thank God, we were able to uh, restore the wetlands as they were here. Um, and we kept all the rivers in place. And then what's really beautiful is Melk uh, started to design small islands in the river so the water speeds up and it's filtered and wetland veg vegetation cleans the pollution and things. So this is at night. This is actually the Joycey is a, is a neighbor who is sending us photos because Bowen got to know the neighbor. Um, but he lives next door so he's like literally living here and looking at the project for us. <laughs> anyway, so if you want to know the rest, you can buy the book with 30% off. I'm so sorry it's not here, but um, thank you for joining me. Are there any questions? Are you going to? Twenty twenty two. Ah, September. Yeah. So the buildings more or less are, are done on the outside and uh, currently they're building the inside. So it's a lot of um, it's quite amazing. There's full full uh, physiotherapy uh, departments for the players, there is an uh, enormous amount of administration, there is a huge legal department for the Olympics that is in the building, there's a press department, uh, it's, it's quite amazing. The inside is super complex with a million uh, departments and, uh, and buildings. I didn't show you all of that, um, but yeah, that's being built out right now. So it's, it's quite a complex uh, set of buildings with a lot of infrastructure. Yeah? And as critical, thank you, to, to the success here. And I'm wondering, were there pitfalls along the way? It can be I'm sure it wasn't all roses and unicorns the whole time. Can you talk about oh, no. those challenges? <laughs> yeah. No, no, I mean, you know, it's, it's a well-known fact. Uh, actually, it was a huge drama somewhere halfway because um, one thing I've learned, if the client invites you for dinner, say no. <laughs> because they take you for dinner and they, they have French wine and all that good stuff. And then they go, um, so um, this was really great that you did SD and now we don't need you anymore. So it's like uh, we were hired actually straight through DD and maybe a little further. So thank God my um, business partner in China was there with a contract. And uh, that became a huge fight <laughs> after the dinner. And, um, and I thought at some point it was not going well. You know, I was sitting there thinking this is actually really not good. And a tiny person, who I didn't know it was, was a tiny person that had been sitting there all along not saying anything, suddenly stood up and said, I'm the inspector from the government to see the process is going really well. And my professional opinion is that they have done too much work and the LDI, that is the client's architect, has done not enough work. So I think this is not the right conclusion at this moment. And I was like, whoa, I like this person. So <laughs> at, th at that point, I thought it was a good moment to close the meeting. So essentially, I said, well, I'm really tired. It's 9 o'clock at night. We just flew in. Can we meet tomorrow morning at night? So because I needed to think <laughs> what to do. So 
we went to the hotel and uh, my partner Justin thought I was tired, you know, so he started all going off and I was like, no, 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 no. Vodka tonics in the bar. We need to strategize. This is, imp we need to figure this out. So anyway, somehow we figured it out and I don't exactly remember how I did it. I, was, I think I was so high on adrenaline that the next day somehow it was turned around. We had our project back and the LDI was doing our work in the second phase because we did their work in the first phase, which I thought was quite a logical solution to the problem. And this little person kept protecting us. I mean, God, I could have kissed her. I was like, yes, like you say. Um, it's an amazing, amazing inspector person. So, but that was hairy, to say the least. I mean, yeah, that was like you're fired kind of moment. Um, paid, but fired. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but then after that, somehow, um, the meetings after that was like the big, big boss would say, you have to do what Winka says. And it was better. I like that part. <laughs> but, the, but the first part was, yeah, was super tricky. And I've heard it from many people, you know, that it's, that they, they don't introduce you, they make you basically work too hard in the first phase and then you actually do the work of the second phase and then they fire you, they only pay you for half, whatever. It's a, a very hard to negotiate. I have to say it was probably also thanks to our own business partner, our Chinese business partner that, because honestly there was a fight going on in Chinese, I had no idea. I just kept giving him ideas in English, you know, like, did you say this already? Um, but yeah, hairy to say the least. And it wasn't just one, you know, it's a big project. It's been a few years, so there's definitely been moments where you're like, Ugh. but it's, it, I think overall, it's, it's, uh, it's going much better than I thought when I was sitting there after my dinner, yeah. Just, but it's not, it's not uncommon, you know. I think every big project, I mean, everyone here who builds knows, it's like we, there's every big project has a moment where you're like, how is this going to end? It's, uh, you have to really, you have to really constantly. Uh, I think the, the biggest thing is your client is not your friend. You know, the client is nice, and again, you really. I think it's important to have visionary clients and important clients, but it's also really important to have a professional relationship that ultimately depends on contracts and not on dinners. <laughs> no more dinners. We're discussing today in the studio that the um, an interest in, in large scale urban slash architectural projects that are becoming just about typical, mm -hmm. especially in, 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 in China. And uh, for me, there'd be a connection between you as chair and a conversation having to do with pedagogical objectives as we alter our strategies, our operational mm -hmm. systems of working with an environment which includes radically increase in scale and time frame. Yeah. This is in Shandagar. You had, I guess, eight weeks for the competition? Yeah, like three months. So yeah. the, the conversation we're having with the students here, that they're moving into an environment which is going to, if anything, going to get um, more compressed than less yeah. compressed, that in eight weeks they have to be able to put together on, on within multiple frameworks of, of mm -hmm. conversations in terms of what design is and multiple scales. And you're yeah. mentioning that they start the landscape before yeah. even this, you finish the design. Typical. Which seems to me that it opens up a conversation of um, that's going to change, uh, it, it's going to alter or expand the way we, we teach or the, how yeah. we prepare people here that's more strategic. But that also has the capacity to um, produce thinking and organizational strategy that are commensurate yeah. and in aligned with the kind of project you showed us today, yeah. Yeah. working at the speed of light. Well, I think and this it, is, it, yeah. it seems like an extremely interesting project, and, yeah. and I, would, I would make the critique that, that we're basically as a... <laughs>
working on uh, the integral approach and really understanding that, um, you know, if they do structures, that that structure information comes, for example, in a net studio who's working on markets and has large span structures. So, like, we try and, like, see our um, structures, construction, history, theory, um, any of those more abstract, more knowledge-based courses, also as our experts in design studios that come in as, you know, almost like acupuncture and, and kind of help students on that level. And I think the reason why we're doing that is exactly what you're saying, because you know, in, in the, the short time frame we did the competition, we literally had to have calculated structures. So this was also like, I think the fact that we made them partners made all the difference because, because they were partners, like the landscape people and we had a whole landscape office, a whole structural office and architecture office working on the same, we had every week, we had brainstorm meetings with all offices and everyone who worked on it um, to, to kind of coordinate it. So there was not like, oh, we're designing a building and bring that to the structure engineer. No, the structure engineer was like with us from the beginning. I was like, no columns. He was like, okay, I'm gonna look at these and these roofs. And then the next meeting, he had three roofs we could choose from that had no columns. You know, it's like, and that has design consequences, right? In the meantime, we're making wobbly discs and he's like, wobbly discs? Um, so yeah, don't worry about it, <laughs> not your problem. But it's like, um, yeah, I think that integrated approach is, is exactly what we're working on uh, at Penn, and I think we're one of the few schools that do. Yeah, and just interesting, so you, it, we could just about, you could start again, and we could spend time discussing this, because I'm looking at the shingling. Mm -hmm. We were talking with my students today about precedent, and it's not seem to be a kind of an interest right now. With you, with you people, and we, we talk about a Sterling. Ah, you start out with Khan. He's the antithesis of anything we're doing at this moment of time. This mm -hmm. is completely fixed and a, a useless strategy at this time, and the world has changed a bit since you know, in the last 50 years or whatever. Um, and you look at the shingling, the conversation we're going to have, maybe you had in your office. Um, Frank did that, and we're in mm, early 80s. He was shingling as a method of dealing with the multiple form. And so we're going to have a conversation, you know, like, mm, we want to go somewhere else because this kind of Frank owns that and it's also a couple decades old. And you have a conversation of what does it mean to make complex forms mm -hmm. and, and, right, and work with, with the reality of, and that's a conversation. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it also is going to deal with precedent because we're going to rattle off X number of architects and Zaha shows up and Ben Van Brickle shows up, right? And we're all aware of those people and we're already aching with this like you've done, mm -hmm. because you're a seasoned architect, we're bringing with this huge amount of information we've already had a history of. This is looked at quickly, but it becomes with us that we understand we're trying to, right, this is one of the operations, this mm -hmm. is skin, but it's going to be very, very important for us because it's going to help move the business around. Right? And if we need to argue into the firm, no, it wants to be completely smooth, yeah. and there's no seams, or it's this, that you have, that be, I think, uh, it'd still be a, a really important conversation. And, mm -hmm. and then that, of course, connects with the structure, and it already had a, a, there's a huge continuity in a comp complex structure. And that's coming from in the first two weeks, and then out through three weeks, mm -hmm. right? That you're moving like this, yeah. and it seems as like your own projects now have to have much more information kind of loaded into them early on, because that's exactly how yeah. they work. Literally, you're gonna walk out the door, and that's just too expensive. Yeah. It's no longer designed a separate isolated activity that just keeps up with it. It's connected to the structure from the get-go, right? Well, I think also, you know, what the big difference is, I remember like, you know, when I started at Penn, I had the first computer room with a bunch of computers and Maya. No one had laptops or computers or whatever. We had a, one classroom here. It was not the, not the lab, it was an actual classroom. And, um, and the difference with then, you know, we would make th things 3D in the computer, you would have to slice it, and then you would build models where you build the slices and you clad the slices, right? So it became never what you actually had been done in the computer. And I think the big, huge difference is we're all now multi-platform, right? Like we can move from 
parametric calculations or the, the, the engineer's calculation, we can put it in Grasshopper, we can script the facade, we can bring that back into a CAD drawing that we can then whatever, no? So it's like, I think the, the biggest, um, the biggest thing to understand is like the multi-platform part is really important because um, you need to be able to convey complex information in three different ways, no? Very quickly, from the engineer to the guy who does plants, <laughs> right? Because you're also building a wetland that is curved and that is funny edges along the wetland and things to sit on in the, you know, the planters in the, in the I, God, the amount of details are like, Stunning. I mean, if you think about it, the set this high includes everything, including planters for trees and uh, patterns for pavement and uh, porous pavement uh, systems, and it's 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 incredible. But it's it's not um, the really the most important thing is to understand that you need to take your teammates seriously. You know, you need to. You, I, and that's, I mean, it's much as like academics, you know, academics were nothing than a bunch of peers that really work hard together to create something that's called education. But to be honest, you students are as important, right? Like you are as important to us as we are to you because in the end, everything is a dialogue and, and only the dialogue will move things forward. So I think that is, that is kind of, um, you know, and that is also, I think, why in my life I've always been, and Tom has been, and everyone sitting here has been. Uh, that's why we are in academics and in practice, because there is an intellectual input from academics that really helps the practice, but the practice really helps the, the actual teaching as well. And, you know, because I get a lot of student questions, you know, you teach us all these rigorous design methods and what are we going to do in practice with it? Well, and I think that's why it's really important that, that we are all in practice so that we can actually help answer these questions and hopefully provide jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's really interesting. I, I just bought a Tesla roof, um, you know, shingle Tesla roof. Really interesting. And it went from 15K to 50K to 79K back to 44K. And I called the guy and I said, do I still have the same roof? Like, what? What is this? <laughs> you know, like, how? I mean, one thing that it went up, right? But then, then it went back down lower than it was the first, the second time up. And I was like, are you doing the whole roof? Are you doing this one side of the roof? What are you doing? <laughs> it's really interesting. <laughs> no, it is Tesla figuring out how to do it. They, they are making cars, so they don't know. I mean, I think they're literally, I'm early in this shingle business, and they literally don't quite know, you know, because they also have a model, which is really interesting for us architects, is that they do everything, and it's true. They do your discounts, they get the building permit, they install it, they take your old roof off, you get new skylight, and as an architect, I'm thinking they're crazy. That's so much work. And, you know, so I wasn't surprised that it went from 15 to 50. I was a bit pissed off about the 79 one. But now it's 44. I'm not really trusting it because I'm thinking, like, what went wrong? Anyway, we'll see. I'll tell you when my roof arrives. Yes. Oh, yeah, so the good news is we're allowed to drink outside. Yay. Thank you, Fritz. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, everyone, for the fact that we can have a drink again.